So I hope everybody remembers the verse that Pastor read for us today, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. I'm not going to go back over it right now. Uh, but as we read the verse earlier, I wonder how many of you were thinking, oh, this is going to be a sermon on love. Because after all, 1 Corinthians 13 is all about love. And yes, love is the greatest of the three attributes that is listed there. Why is love the greatest? Well, love is the greatest because it's the foundation of the mission of God. It is the foundation of everything that he does in this world is because of his love. And our mission in this life should be because of love. We all love someone or something or both. But love is the greatest of the three attributes. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 even tells us that if we don't do anything, if we do anything without love, it is worthless. It is meaningless. It has no value. Love is the greatest because it is the foundation of the mission of God and of life. However, this sermon isn't about love. Well, Chad, then it must be about faith. Because after all, without faith, we cannot please God. That's what Hebrews 11.6 tells us. And faith is vital for us to following God because it is his tool that he uses to do his work in and through us. When we have faith, we open up God, the, the ability for God, not that God needs us, but to work through us and in us. Faith is also the anchor we need to secure us to both God's love and his hope. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now again, grace is what saves us, but faith is what allows God to come in. We open the door through our faith for him to come in and save us. And this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. And faith is essential for following Jesus. But this sermon is not about faith either. No, we're going to focus on the third characteristic there. The one at the end, the one that this world so desperately needs, and that is hope. Hope. And folks, as you can see by the news, by streaming, any place you talk, anybody you talk to, we live in a world that is looking for hope. Now, why is that? Why are we in a world that's looking for hope? I mean, we are in the, one of the richest nations in the world. We have everything that we could ever want at our fingertips. So why are we looking for hope? Well, it's because we've messed up the definition of the word. When we talk about hope, we talk, divine it as something we desire to happen or something we want. Something we desire to happen or something we want. Let me give you an example. I hope that the, world, the Orioles win the World Series this year. A lot of us hope that. And so far they started out pretty well, just two games into 162. But we, that's what we say. I hope the Orioles, like, I got to brag a little bit, not that I played, but my team, for the first time ever, made it into the Final Four. Yeah. And I hope they can beat the number one team in the country next week. Is that going to happen? Probably not. But that's what I hope. But because it's something I want, something I desire. By the way, for the, everybody who knew about my team is Alabama. Um, or we say, you know, I hope my husband gets me roses today. Or whatever your favorite flower is, ladies. I, ho I hope my husband brings those home today. Or we say, oh, I hope I do not get sick. I mean, during the pandemic, we were saying that every day, right? I hope I don't catch that. And now people catch a day and it's like, eh, whatever. <laughs> That's how much we've changed in three years, you know? But this type of hope, we usually refer to expressing something we desire, something that we want. And even voting is an expression of hope. 
when we vote coming up in the next few months, we're expressing a hope in the government that they can fix our problems and do all this other stuff. Now, right now, Uncommitted is leading both candidates, so <laughs> shows you how much we have a hope in our government this year, right? But folks, this definition is not a good thing, especially when it comes to following Jesus. To me, one of the saddest things I hear from people as they're about to leave this world is, I hope I get into heaven. I hear that. I hope I get into heaven. And on a lesser note, I, it drives me crazy when people who say they're Christians and trust God say, well, I hope God blesses this. I hope God does this tomorrow. Well, do you believe him or not? Because that's what leads to. This kind of hope leads, is one of doubt and uncertainty, and it leads us down paths that never benefits us or keeps us from what God truly has for us. Because if we're using hope as what we want and desire, it creates doubt. Can God really do this? And folks, this kind of hope cannot help us in any way, shape, or form. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not the hope that Paul is describing here in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 13. That is not the kind of hope that he's talking about. The hope that is one of the three greatest is the sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised us now and in the future. Let me repeat that. It is the sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised us now and in the future. It's like the boy in the story who had hope in his father. And so the boy goes to school at kindergarten, and on the, one day a tornado hits the school, causing the building to collapse. But thankfully, the kindergarten teacher had moved the kids into a corner of the room that somehow created a pocket. So they're all safe in this pocket, but they're buried under rubble. Okay? And so some of the kids are starting to cry and being scared. And the little boy keeps saying, hey, my dad promised me he will come. My dad will be here. You wait. He'll be here. He'll come. 30 minutes later, he hears a voice calling his name, and it's his dad. He had driven all the way back from work to come to the school. And so his son starts yelling. And after a few minutes, a hole appears, and the rescue workers are able to pull them out. The boy had hope, confidence in his dad that he would be there. And he shared that with them. And this is the hope that Jesus offers us if we follow him. We can believe him and trust him because of this one very real truth. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, did you catch what Peter said was our true hope? It is a living hope. And that living hope is Jesus, a resurrected and living Jesus. Revelation 1, 17 and 18, John writes, When I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we celebrate Easter, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ died on a cross, paying the debt we could not owe for our sins, our disobedience, our hatred of God. We couldn't pay that debt back, but Jesus died on a cross and was buried. He shed his blood so that we could receive forgiveness and be cleansed of our sins. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And like I said, he was buried. But guess what? Dead people cannot give you hope. Dead people cannot give you hope. Because him dying and staying dead, he becomes just like all those sheep and all those cattle that they were getting. Somebody else was going to have to come and do it again. But to seal the fact that Jesus was the last sacrifice, God had to do something special. And what he did was he raised him from the dead. 
to set Jesus apart and make that sacrifice last forever. God raised him from the dead and he is still alive today. He is our living hope and we can be confident that he is with us until the end and beyond. So what hope promises us is this goal, is the goal. Love is the foundation. Faith is the tool. Hope is the goal, the end game. It gives us the confidence to trust God with everything. It is what bolsters our faith and strengthens our love. Hebrews 11, 6, I mean 11, 1, sorry. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Did you hear that? The assurance of things hoped for. Some translations say the confidence of things hoped for. Psalm 147, 11 says this, But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. It bolsters our faith and strengthens our love for God and for others. Gotquestions.org, a really cool website. If you ever have questions about the Bible, go there. Um, it says this, Hope is built in our unwavering confidence in God's goodness and power to do what he says he will do because of his unfailing love for us. Such confidence declares about our Savior, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Biblical hope, like faith, takes custody here and now, here and now of God's good promises yet to come. Why? Because he is the living Savior. Again, this hope is a confident expectation in the one who is our living hope. We can trust him to do what he says he is going to do. So we can pray with confidence that God both hears our prayers and answers them, especially if we pray according to his will. We can be confident that God loves us and cherishes us no matter what we do or say or think. <clears throat> now, we should be striving to be more like God. That means we should be striving to stop sinning. But when we do, God still loves us and he will forgive us, forgive us if we ask. We can be confident that he will be with us in every situation, good or bad. So, everybody knows what happened Tuesday. The bridge fell. Found out through the BCMD that there was a pastor who was on the bridge just minutes before it fell. He was coming home from a mission trip in Guatemala. Crossed the bridge just a few minutes before the boat hit the pylon. And now he is heading efforts up on that side of the bridge... To help the port families through the churches there. But he was that close. So he thanked God. He was confident that God was with him in any and every situation, good or bad. We can be confident that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We can be confident that God will help us to be more like Jesus. We don't have to do it by ourselves, people. God will help us. We can be confident that no matter what is happening, God will bring out good in it, even if it's not the good that we want. He will bring good for his glory. We can be confident that if we know him, then we are his children and that we are important to him. So many people today, the reason they don't have hope is because they don't feel like they have value. Because everything that they've hoped in has let them down. But God doesn't let us down. Pastor's right. And he said in the, first, in the sunrise service, you know, not many people would die for me. I mean, they're done. I mean, I don't know of any of you, if you will, thank you, but I don't know of any of you who would die for me. Shelly will, maybe. But um, <laughs> no, she would die for me. Okay, she said that wore money. Anyway, um, but folks, Jesus died for us, even though we were his enemies. Get it? Enemies. Not a stranger. Enemies. He died for us. That is mind-blowing. And we can be confident that we are important to him. But we also have to understand that it doesn't mean that we get what we want. Okay? Because today, that's how people feel important, is they get what they want. But that's not really how you feel important, because, again, that hope lets you down. 
<clears throat> we can be confident that God has prepared a place for his children in heaven with him for all eternity. So if you know God, if you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, God is preparing a place for you in heaven. You have a home after you die. And it'll be the most awesome place ever. And we can't even bear it. We just scratch the surface of how awesome it's going to be. Because God is so much more awesome. But if you know Christ, you have that home. And we don't have to say, well, I hope I get there. I know I'll be there. You can be that confident. And we can be confident that he has saved us if we have surrendered our lives to him. We can be confident that he has saved us, that he has brought, come into a relationship with us, and that we have eternal life, and that he will walk with us from the day we surrender until forever. We can be that confident. 1 Peter 13, 1, 3 and 4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Yesterday, we got Shelly's Christmas present, a sofa and a love seat. We've been married for over 30 years. This was the first time we'd ever bought furniture ourselves. Everything has been handed down to us. And so yesterday we had that new furniture smell. You know, it's in our house now. Just like the new car smell. When you get that new car, you know, you can. So one time I tell the story. Sorry. So my, I was taking my son Jason out to look for a car. And we wanted to look at this Ford car that this one place had. And we got in it, and it smelled like pizza. And the guy said, he said it, we've cleaned this thing out three times. It was a big deterrent to us saying no to said vehicle because it smelled like pizza all the time. So it must have been a delivery car. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, but <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, God has given us an inheritance that will never fade, that will never rust, that will never tear, that will never be destroyed. It's going to be here forever. You don't have to put a new coat of paint on it. When you get there, it's going to be there, and it's going to stay that way. We can't imagine that here. But up there, yeah, it's going to be amazing. And in Christ, we find a true and living hope that is better than what we can think or imagine. Yet, we miss out on it so many times because we use the world definition of hope. And that leads us to not loving Jesus and not believing in Jesus. That leads us to saying, I don't love Jesus and I don't believe Jesus because he doesn't do for me what I want. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have the wrong definition of hope. When we, and we apply that definition to God. How can we have this confident expectation? How can we do that? Well, the answer is this. We must first choose to believe that Jesus is that living hope. We have to believe it. After all, Christianity is based on faith. They work together. We have to choose to believe that he is that living hope. And that we have to then trust him. So that means we humble ourselves and rely on him. We humble ourselves and we rely on him. That's what it means. And then once we do that, we step out in that faith, in that hope. Being confident that God's going to lead us in the right path. Being confident that he will be there for us. Being confident that if, even if we mess up, he's going to forgive us if we confess it. Being confident that he will give us everything that we need to do what he's called us to do. We can be that confident.
gotquestions.org had a great ending to this sermon. I prayed and prayed as to what to do, and it just came up, so I'm, I'm quoting from them. <clears throat> People cannot survive long without hope, and we see that all the time. I believe the number one cause of suicide in the world is hopelessness. People have tried everything else that they think they need to try, and it doesn't work, and so then they take their lives. That's the number one cause. But we cannot survive long without hope. Hope keeps us going through painful experiences and fear of what the future may hold. And right, as I said right now, people are more committed to voting for uncommitted than for our two candidates. There's not a lot of hope in our future right now in this country. In a fallen world, we need a living hope. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.12 that those who don't have Jesus Christ do not have hope or true hope. Believers are blessed with real and substantial hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the reasons why we should be sharing Jesus with those in our world. We have the real hope. And it was never meant for us to hold on to selfishly. We should be telling people about Jesus and about this hope. We should be doing that. Telling people about Jesus and this living hope. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by the power of God's word and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this living hope quickens our minds and our souls. It changes thoughts, words, and actions. And once dead in our sins, we are now alive with Christ in the hope of our own resurrection someday. So when Mr. Art passes, he's going to be resurrected into heaven. When I pass, I'm going to be resurrected into heaven because I have a living hope. And I'm going to experience the same resurrection that he did. Now, somebody, you're not going to go to my grave and the dirt's going to be cleared away and the casket open. That's not going to happen. It's going to be a spiritual resurrection. Um, and so I'll be in heaven with him as soon as I close my eyes for the last time. So don't go to my grave thinking, oh, Chad's dirt's going to be gone and there's a casket open. That means a grave robber, okay? Just letting you know. Or somebody's trying to bring me back a life another way. Anyway, the believer's living hope is solid and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's in Hebrews chapter 6. And you want to know how really awesome and cool this living hope is? There's one part of the crucifixion story that a lot of times we don't talk about. But while Jesus is dying, as he's dying, closing his eyes, saying it is finished, the curtain that kept man from God in the temple was ripped in half. Not from the bottom up, but from the up bottom top down. And ladies and gentlemen, that curtain was taller than this building. So no human being climbed up there and like, oh, I'm going to write it down. He did not do that. God ripped it to allow us into his presence when we could not enter into his presence. But once a year, one person, now everybody can be in his presence. So Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, is our Savior, our salvation, and our living hope. So as we come to the invitation, my question for you is, do you have that living hope? Are you confident in your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're not, then now is the day to get ready, to get right with him. Either maybe there's sin in your life that's kind of hurting your relationship with him and you need to confess that. Do that. Make it right. Start following him again. Or maybe you don't know him at all. Like I said, the saddest thing a person can say on their deathbed is, I hope I get into heaven. We should be saying, okay, God, I'm ready. Let's do this. If you don't know Jesus, today is the day to give your life to him. Because, again, he loves you. He proved that by dying for you on a cross, taking your place. Taking away the sin that we commit. Shedding his blood so he could cleanse us and make us whole. 
who was buried and rose again on the third day so that we could have a living hope and eternity with him for all lifetime.